Merry Christmas, everyone. God bless you. So yesterday I was at the barber shop. Can you tell? <laughs> and interesting things happen with me and when I'm at the barber shop. Okay. Generally, um, we'll be talking about any mundane subject. It might be sports, okay, um, or something else. And someone will inevitably say something religious. And that's when your pastor kind of gets the little Grinch grin on his face. And I start to poke at people and ask questions for the purpose of helping them to see the Bible from God's point of view, changing their perspective. And so yesterday, a woman came in, and we were, um, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, yada, yada, yada. And she said, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe in that stuff, that Christmas tree. You guys are serving the sun god. And Jesus never said you're supposed to be worshiping his birth. You're supposed to be, I mean, she just. <laughs> now, I'm in the chair getting done. Luckily, or well, fortunately, the barber hadn't gotten to my goatee yet. Because when they get to the beard, you can't talk. You got to just. So he hadn't gotten to that yet. So I said, oh, I can I get in there. I can get in there. So she's, and you can, you can see me. I was wiggling. I was like, oh, I want to get in there. I, I got something to say. And so I asked her a question, Rich. I said, look, are you saying that you don't believe in Christ? Because I have to organize the argument. How many of you know that? You can't argue from all over. I got to organize the argument. I got to know where, we, where we're coming from here. So I, so I said, are we talking about whether or not you believe in Christ or you, do you have a problem with the commercialization of Christmas? She really didn't know how to answer the question. And you know why? Because she has allowed the commercialization of Christmas to overshadow the reality of Jesus Christ coming to the earth. How many of you know that she's not alone? I was out shopping yesterday and I got cold, cold cash, or cold dollars, whatever they call that, cold cash to prove it. So you know where I went shopping. I also went to another mall and got some other things and I went online Larry, you mean to tell me two days before Christmas you were shopping? Yeah. And it wasn't because I was procrastinating. It was because I had a lot of schoolwork. Over the last two weeks, I've had essentially four papers, three tests, a boatload of reading, that had to be completed, some of which last Monday and some were last Friday, just last past Friday. So when I went to work, I was doing my homework between orders. When I got home, I was doing my work. I, you, Marissa was doing her thing and she, but thank God for a wonderful family who puts up the Christmas tree, who decorates and does all that. These are things that in the past I would help doing, but I couldn't. So yeah, I was shopping yesterday, okay? Here's a question. I wanna to talk to you today about the beauty of Christmas. The message that God is with us. And he's with us through our questions, through our confusion, through our dilemmas, through the decisions that we make by virtue of our dilemmas, he is with us. I want to talk to you about Mary and Joseph and talk about their questions and, 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 and confusion and their dilemmas and their, their, their decisions that they made based on those things and see if we can't find ourselves there in just a few minutes that I have before you. So, Luke 1 verse 26 through 39. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, 
Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. In verse 20, uh, 56 says this, And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. How long was she with Elizabeth? Three months. And then returned. So Mary gets this word from this angel. First of all, if an angel appears to me, I'm going to be startled, as would you, but it's interesting as to what Mary's confusion was. It was not by the entrance or the entreatment of an angel. It was something very specific the angel said, and we're going to look at that in a moment. But let's just go back for a moment. Here's Mary who was betrothed to Joseph. What does that mean? That basically means that she was engaged to Joseph. However, this engagement is not like you and I. We get engaged and, uh, you know, you get her upset three months before the wedding. She says the wedding is off and that's that. OK, but when in those days, being betrothed meant that this engagement was binding. OK, it was binding. And the husband or the wife could actually uh, issue or go for a divorce if there was infidelity that took place prior to the actual marriage. So for them, this betrothal period was really like being married because you were not only promised to your beloved, you were to act in a certain way with regards to that, that, uh, that bindment. You get that? You get that? So, so it's an engagement, but it's a binding engagement. Okay? All right. So we have this engaged, and I'm going to use the term engagement throughout the sermon, but I just needed to explain to you what that meant. It's not the same thing that we do, okay, in engagements, okay? Okay, it's binding. It's binding. It's almost like being married, almost, okay? Now, this engaged girl, virgin, 16, 15, she could have even been 13 years old, young girl, minding her own business, here's the angel what verse was that? In the sixth month, the angel, who came? I mean, the cat came. Gabriel came. Not um, um, angel named Larry or angel named Lazarus. Gabe came, the big boy. He came to this little teenage girl and says, listen, listen, listen. Look at verse uh, uh, 28. And he came to her and said, greetings. Oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. But verse 29 says, she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern, figure out what sort of greeting this might be. Why? Why? She's not scared or surprised because it's an angel. I'm telling you, you and I would be, I'm telling you right now, you and I, how many has ever had an angel appear to them? Oh, okay. No, nobody. Okay? That's, 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 that's cool. I'm telling you, if an angel comes to you, more than likely, you're going to 
You're going to be, you, know, you all through the scriptures we see this. But strangely, she's not surprised by the angel. Her confusion is in what the angel proclaimed to her initially. He said, you're favored. Wait a minute. Women? Jewish women? Being favored? Oh, there were a few throughout the history of, of Israel. But by and large, it's been men that have been favored. What do you do when you hear a word from God or somebody, you get this inclination that you're kind of special to God? What do you do with information that you get from somebody, from within, from without, that you are something other, listen carefully, something other than what you grew up and was taught to be. What if someone says to you, you know, what's in you will take you to great places and take you before great men. But everything you've been taught has been just the opposite that you're no one, you're insignificant. How many of you know that we have confusion? Confusion happens. Nothing wrong with confusion. But generally what happens is this. When confusion comes in, inevitably, we will ask questions. How many of you have asked questions? Whether outright or internally, you ask questions Sometimes they're directed straight at God. Sometimes they're directed outward, but you're not directing it toward God. But since he's the one who actually threw the monkey wrench into your life to cause the question, that is who your question is, 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 um, is after. See, here's the point. You may not have ever come to church. You may not have ever been raised in this Christian, quote unquote, way. And you question why Christians even do this. It's crazy. Your confusion by what you see on the outside. The institution that we call Christianity has confused you and has covered and hidden who Jesus Christ really is. And so you have questions, although you have not articulated them. God says the questions are all right. He's not worried about our questions. They're okay. Confusion is okay. But ask the question nonetheless. And so, so Mary asks a question. The angel says, don't be afraid, Mary, for you've found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and his name shall be called Savior or Jesus. Verse 32. And will be a, he will be great, and be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In verse 34, Mary asks her question. How can this be since I'm a virgin? Oh, think about that question for a moment. Because we could ask some really great questions. Now, if you're an engaged woman, Sandy, and the Lord sends an angel to you and tells you that you are going to have a baby and that baby will be great, why is that a big issue? Because you don't know when that's going to come to pass. See, it could come to pass after you get married. And of course, then the baby would be by your husband, Joe. But Mary understood exactly what the angel was saying. She understood that the angel was saying, no, 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 you, in your virgin status, after having no, not known a man, you will have a baby. And this baby be, will be a product of the Holy Spirit coming down upon you. 
So Mary's confusion led to a question. But what's wonderful about these questions that we ask God, God always sends answers if we're listening because he's with us. By virtue of the answer she received from Gabriel, she said, be it so. Not a problem. See, the confusion led to clarity. But what was in between confusion and clarity were questions. And I'm telling you that if you have questions, if you're wondering why, if you're wondering what this whole thing is all about, and I'm talking to Christians and non-Christians now, God says, if you just listen to me, I will, conf I will clear up your confusion with an answer that will bring clarity. Now, here's the thing. After she got her answer, the Bible says that she went to her cousin Elizabeth's house. Why did she go to Elizabeth's house? Because as we read, the angel, after he told her that you are going to receive, have a child by virtue of a miracle, by the way, your relative Elizabeth is also pregnant. Mary's scratching her head now. She's saying, really? Because she was barren. She can't have children. So the angel confirms the miracle that he tells her with another miracle. Your cousin or your, your relative who is, who is barren will have a child. The scripture says that in those days, Mary immediately went to her cousin miles away. The Bible does not say that Joseph went with her. I'm making a little point here. So let me ask you something. Most cases, do women show that they're pregnant? In most cases, in one month? What, about what time do they start showing? I mean, it all depends, I guess, right? But generally, about four months? Five months. Okay, so let's assume for a moment Mary heard the word and then for a month hung out. The Bible says in those days she went to her. She goes to Elizabeth for how many months? You think by the time she came home, she might be showing? Let's pick it up in Matthew's gospel. And let's get Joseph's perspective. Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. We got to figure it's four months later now. Four or five months later. If she stayed there where she lived for a month, went to Elizabeth for three months, that's four months now, right? Takes a few days to get back to her home. You got to figure she's about four months, at minimum four months pregnant, right? All right. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on. She was found to be with child. Homegirl is showing now. Homegirl can't hide the funk now. She can't wait. You know, back in the day, you know, when we first got married, you know, the, 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 the um, <coughs> excuse me, the maternity clothes were out here like this. You know what I mean? They got bigger and bigger. Now, y'all like to show the bump. You know what I mean? So it, you kind of look like I look right now, but I'm not pregnant. Trust me. Trust me, I'm not pregnant. But just imagine that Mary left to, her, to, to Elizabeth's house looking like this and came home looking like this. But homegirl's a virgin. Right. Right. Let's, let's get into Joseph. Hey, brothers, let's get into Joseph's mindset. Okay, never mind these women, they talking about, yeah, 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 yeah. okay, you're a virgin, uh-huh. Let's get into Joseph's mindset. Go ahead, my sister. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. 
Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not, until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph's dilemma in verse 18. What's his dilemma? What's Joseph's dilemma? The girl that I'm betrothed to is pregnant. She tells me that this pregnancy is a product of the Holy Spirit. But since I don't have any history no reference from which to draw of this so-called, of Mary's reality. I know that this can't be so. But I'm a good man. I'm a just man. I love her. And I could divorce her. And hence, publicly humiliate her. Instead of doing that openly, I will divorce her privately. His dilemma led him to make a decision or to take a course of action based on his limited knowledge and historical reference. Our dilemmas do the same thing. Since in most cases we have no historical reference points. Because how do you know if God is not calling you to be a trend setter? Which means there is no example of what you will become. It doesn't exist. The apostle Paul did not exist before Paul was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. That person did not exist. That work did not exist. That calling did not exist. What calling has God given you that doesn't exist yet? You have no reference point. There's nothing with which to draw on. And yet you're called, you're expected to believe God. Ah, but what did Joseph do? He was deciding on a course of action. But the scripture says he considered these things. Say that with me, consider these things. Consider your dilemma. Think about it. Think about it. I have no history. There's nothing I can look at, God, that tells me that adds faith and adds confidence to my dilemma. What do I do? I know what I'll do. I'll, because I'm a good man and I love this woman, I'll divorce her privately. I'll keep it out of the line light. I'll stay in the shadows I'll back up I'll be real quiet I'll get out of the limelight I'll be very private about this I won't say much I will not shout it upon the hilltops I'll speak softly I will not carry a big stick I will fade into the darkness and I will say nothing of that which is in me. Until you consider your dilemma. Look at verse 19. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered, someone say, as he considered... Yeah. As he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Oh, there's those dreams again. 
saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Skip down to verse 24. Well, no, let's read 23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. This is in uh, 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 fulfillment to the prophetic word given to Isaiah, right? In, to to um, compare a son, and, he shall, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? This son, Joseph, that your virgin has in her stomach is from the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you about this boy. This boy is Emmanuel. He is God with us. Do you think that, that uh, Joseph now has some more information that he can now draw from? So his dilemma, which led to a faulty decision, albeit in the right heart, he now has a word on top of his dilemma and his decision that inform his dilemma. And now he can make better choices. Look at what Joseph does. Look at this. Verse 24. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did exactly as the angel the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus, which again is the Greek form of the word Joshua, which means the Lord saves. Principle number two, if we're not careful, when faced with dilemmas, we tend to make decisions based on what is obvious or not, even if they are for the right reasons. However, when we hear from God, we get clarity. So just as Mary was confused, asked questions, but got a word, and therefore she had clarity. Joseph had a dilemma, made a decision, got a word, and therefore had clarity. How many of you are in a dilemma right now? How many of you are making decisions based on your dilemma, but you haven't heard a word from God, which means you don't have clarity? How many of you are confused by what's going on, and so you have questions, but you haven't heard from God, which is, means why, which is why you don't have clarity? Let me give you some good news on Christmas Eve. The good news is this. God is with us. Say that with me. Say, God is with us. Say, God is with us. So even in my dilemma, God is with us. Even in my confusion, God is with us. Even though I don't have the answers, God is with us. Let's make it personal now. God is with me. God is with me. God is with me. God is with me. Let me finish up here. What does that mean that God is with us? What does it mean that God is with us? Well, the scripture says that Jesus is the mighty counselor. Let's stop there. The mighty counselor is with you. My wife is a wonderful counselor. I only wish she could tell me what goes on in the session. She can't. That would be a breach. So she can't. But she can tell me this. She says, listen, you know, I'm helping somebody and um, they told some friends because they're being helped and their lives are changing. They told some friends and their friends are now coming to me and those friends are being helped. I feel so fulfilled in my ministry that I'm helping people. It's because of the counseling gift led and under the control of the Holy Spirit. So if you're confused today, the mighty counselor is with you. The scripture says that he is the prince of peace. How many of you don't raise your hands but suffer from, not, from the lack of peace? You don't have peace, yet you're a Christian, but you don't have peace. Maybe you're not a Christian and you don't have peace. You walk around in a state of anxiety. Jesus says, I am with you. 
And the one who is the perfect peace, the peace giver, the prince of peace, is with you. Here's what that means in real life. Mark, you can get ready, brother. You see, without going into details, because I can't, there are people that come for prayer. Maybe they come up to the altar. Maybe they go to someone they can trust. They sit with that individual and they cry based on their pain, based on their confusion, based on their dilemmas and their questions. And they sit down with this individual, Brother Rich, and they share their heart. And what comes out of that conversation with the counselor, with the brother or sister in Christ, is information that had they had prior to the meeting, they would not be in that state. In other words, the information that they receive by virtue of the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, they say, wow, burdens are lifted. Burdens are lifted. They come off. They get delivered. They experience freedom. Now, I'm going to share a little vision with you, and then we're going to do a little exercise, and we're going to be done. Here's my vision. I'm calling it Soul Care Ministries. Soul Care. Here's what the vision looks like, Jeff. Jeff. We have a room here, right here at Montclair Community Church. And it's called the Soul Care Room. It's beautiful. It's wonderfully painted. We've got art on the walls. We've got soft lighting. We've got people like Marissa and, 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 and Jeff, where's your wife? She's, she's downstairs. And, and, and my sister, counselors, who not only love God, not only are Holy Spirit filled, but understand what counseling is. We have pastors and other caregivers who love people, people who know how to pray, people who know how to give wisdom, people who are led by the Spirit of God, as Kathleen was a few weeks ago when she was praying for me without even knowing it. When I came to her a week later, I said, I got to tell you, thank you for that prayer. She said, what prayer? I don't even remember. No, because the Holy Spirit led the prayer. Imagine for a moment if we had a place. Oh, let me speak in the affirmative. Imagine for a moment when we have a place here at Montclair Community Church called the Soul Care Wing. So that after church, if you got stuff going on, you can walk into the Soul Care Wing. And in that wing, there's soft music playing. You've got people in there that will cry with you, that will hold you, by, will hold you in their arms. Even men who have never resolved the identity crisis because their fathers were so mean and angry or are not there. And they've never, ever resolved the identity crisis, which is the reason for their anger. They can go into that room and have another brother. See, I love you. This is called soul care. It's God with us. It's God with us. <laughs> it's God with us. So if you would, let me get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve pockets of people. Twelve pockets. Just, just, just stand up. And just kind of kind of get in a circle together with one another. I want you to do something. Come on, let's do it. Let's do it. You got about three pockets over here, maybe four pockets over here, another four here, maybe another two or three over there. If you would. If you would. And say this with me. No matter what your questions are. No matter what your confusion is, God is with you. God is with you. His name is Jesus. He lives in me. And I speak on his behalf. God 
is with you. God is with you. Now I want you to close your eyes now. And I want you to say this to yourself. God is with me. God is with me. In my confusion. With my questions. In my dilemmas. Even my poor decisions. He has not left me. He is with me. Now if you would. Just pray for one another in the way that you can pray, the way that the Lord has given you to pray for them. Some of you might sense something very specific and therefore you might pray that or it might be a generic or general prayer, whatever it is. I want you to realize the fellowship that you have right now with your brothers and sisters and pray for them in light of the reality that God is with them. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask our worship singers to come back to the stage and our ushers to prepare for our offering as Adele leads us in I need you. I need you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Merry, merry Christmas to all of you. God is with us.